All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I think we'll get started. Uh, many th thanks for joining the webinar today. My name is Ginny Barber. I'm the Director of Open Access Australasia, uh, which is a member organisation supported by uh, 20 universities in Australia, eight in New Zealand, and uh, five affiliate members. Um, we are uh, a member. Our principles, uh, in case you haven't come across us before, and I, I know there's a few people here that are perhaps uh, new to our webinars, are we are supporting equity and scholarly communications, diverse ecosystem of open approaches, integrity and quality in research, maximising the impact of research, um, appropriate and respectful use of indigenous knowledges, and retention of rights by authors or their institutions. And so I'm especially um, uh, pleased today that we have a, a, a speaker, Sabrina Caldwell, who will be taking us in some different directions to where we've, we've been before. Um, so before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge the um, Turrbal and Yagara people, um, who are the traditional owners of the land that I'm on in southeast Queensland. Uh, UNSW is Open Access Australasia's host institution, and it's lo located on the Bedigal the La Perouse and the Gadigal CBD lands of the Eora Nation in the Sydney Basin. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are present here today, and note that this land was, was never ceded. So uh, just some, uh, some housekeeping. We are recording this webinar, so and we will post it on the website afterwards. Uh, we will keep, please, if you can, keep your microphone muted, and if you'd like to turn off your camera, that's that's fine too. Uh, if you could type your questions into the chat, we'll read out and respond to them at the end, and we will aim to finish on or just before the hour. So I'm delighted to say that our speaker today is Sabrina, Dr. Sabrina Caldwell. Sabrina is a researcher in the ANU School of Computing, investigating human perspectives and perceptions of image credibility and effective reasoning. She's a member of the International JPEG Committee and the Australian Chapter of Creative Commons and the Australian Chapter of Creative Commons uh, are affiliate members of Open Access Australasia, so we have a very close and warm relationship. Sabrina holds uh, PhDs in Computer Sciences and the Arts and Social Sciences and has an extensive background in the information technology industry. So I'm really looking forward to this talk today and um, look forward to hearing uh, Sabrina's uh, uh, perspective on all of this. So I'll hand over to Sabrina, Sabrina and let her share her screen and we'll come back to you at the end of the talk. Thank you, Ginny and Sandra. Um, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to present to such a great group of people. Usually I'm presenting to students as many of you would be familiar with. Um, and so it's lovely to be speaking to a group of such a diverse group of people with uh, sophisticated interests in this area. Um, Ginny, are my slides visible? Yep, all good, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the first thing I would like to do is to also add to what Ginny said. I'm speaking to you from uh, the far southeast uh, coast, and I wish, wish to acknowledge the Yuan people on whose land I am meeting with you today and to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, okay, so now if you have a look at this slide, you'll see that it says log into Socrative. The first little bit of my presentation is somewhat interactive. If you want to interact with it, um, if you log into Socrative and use the room number that you can see there, um, then uh, you will be able to vote on uh, a, a few things. I will progress the slides, um, and the, but the uh, Socrative login information and the room number are still on each slide for the next little while. And I think Ginny is also planning to put this information into the chat. I have not bothered to read to you the, the word of the decade. I, and I would like to just make a comment that my slides are kind of jam-packed with information. I may speak to um, all of the things on a particular slide, or I may pass over it quickly, uh, but all of it is useful, I hope, for you. And so if you want to look at the slides later on, uh, Ginny and Sandra will be loading them up, and you can have a look at them and read anything that you may have, I, I may have gone by quickly and you didn't get. The talk I'm giving today is going to cover these things. We're doing an introduction and some context now. And then I'm going to talk about human perspectives on image credibility human perceptions of 
credibility. And these are two different distinct ideas. Uh, one is what do we think about images uh, and their credibility? And the other one is, are we able to see manipula manipulations in images? Then I wanna talk to you about solutions that are on the drawing board and then talk to you about some open points to ponder. So let's start here. Um, I want, these are five images uh, varying uh, either manipulated or unmanipulated. And this is the interactive part. If you go to Socrative, you will see that, and I can see that a couple of people have already joined and I have been able to vote already. Uh, the, if you have a look at the top left image, which is also available in, to be seen in the Socrative uh, page that you're looking at, my question to you is, is this image manipulated or is it not manipulated? And I'll give you a very, very short period of time to think about each one of these because we have such a lot of ground to cover in the time that we have available. So only you know, make a pretty snap decision. That's pretty much how much time you would look at an image anyway in, real, in the real world. So I'm going to count down from three, two, one. Okay, and with the people who have answered, uh, two thirds have said that it is manipulated and one third have said that it's not manipulated. And that's changed a little bit now at 60, 40. So this image is manipulated. Ford uh, doctored the photo of the Shelby 1000 car, uh, showing it lifting off at the front with the first two wheels. I don't know about you guys, but I don't usually like my car to take off on only the two back tires. So uh, a lot of people complained about that. The numbers that you see there, 42 and 46, indicate how many people in all of the times I've run this, how many people have got it right and how many people have got it wrong. And as you can see, it's about half and half. All right, the next one. Okay, so do you think that the photograph on the bottom left has been manipulated? And as I say, we're going very quickly. So I'll go three, two, one. All right, and we've got about half and half. 52% half, say it is manipulated and 48% say it is not manipulated. Let's see who is right. This is not a manipulated photograph and I'll be talking more about this photograph later. The next one is the one in the middle top. Is this photograph manipulated or not manipulated? Everybody's uh, learned that the, they need to answer quickly. Well done. Okay, so three, two, one. Now we've got no, it's not manipulated 70% and 30% say that it, it is manipulated. Scarily enough, no, this one was not manipulated. That is a real photograph. Okay, the next one. That's the one at the bottom on the right. Um, that, do you think that that photograph has been manipulated? People are thinking it's going slower. Okay, so three, two, one. We've got, yes, it's manipulated is 62% and no, it is not manipulated is 38%. It is manipulated. This is a piece of photo art by a photo artist by the name of Eric Johansson. And last but not least, this next one, the one on the right-hand side. Do you think this is manipulated? Okay, three, two, one. 82% I apologize, 62% say it is not manipulated and 38% say it is manipulated. And the answer to that is, it is not manipulated, believe it or not. This is a real house called Krzywik Domek in Poland and the Krzywik Domek is Polish for crooked house. I have often thought that one day I might put that into Photoshop and straighten it out and use it that way. So images, 
Um, you'll get, I, I, I use the words images and photographs a little bit loosely, more loosely than I should, but in my mind, I imagine these two things as a photograph being a representation of the real world, people, places, and events, and um, uh, basically a record of the light that bounces off some object in the real world. And an image being uh, all photographs are images, but not all images are photographs. So an image might be something that's completely synthetic and not a natural image. We have, this is a statistic from 2014. I haven't looked at it lately. Probably I should update it, but I haven't lately. But in any case, we're talking about quite a lot of millions of cameras being produced every year. And when you think about the fact that smartphones are now containing multiple cameras, I wouldn't like to try to figure out what that number is. And as you can see that over time, starting in about 1950s, 1960s, the number of cameras in the world started increasing. And now it's, there's so many that they're pretty much uh, pervasive in society, 5 billion or so. To get some idea of what that might look like, here's a, an image from a, a wonderful uh, uh, art installation that was done in 2011 by a, an artist named Eric Kessels. And he printed out all of the images that were uploaded to Flickr in a 24 hour period, which was a million. And this, so he printed out 1 million photographs and then he just piled them in drifts in a, an art gallery. And this is just one of a multiple rooms. All of these images, some of them are transitory, some of them are enduring. Uh, most of them are powerful in their way and some of them can be really powerful. Over time, we have seen a lot of ways in which uh, photographs have made a huge difference. Uh, one of the, um, Unfortunately, it's a negative example, but one of the more significant ones that we've seen lately is uh, when George Floyd was videoed during a fatal arrest last year, and the, the, the response that happened in society to that event was prompted by images that were portrayed to other people around the world. So that just gives you some idea of the kind of power that an image can have. Uh, Susan Sontag, uh, in, the, uh, in 1977, in her book on photography, uh, made the comment that photographs are, are they're evidentiary proof of something that's real. That was true in 1977. I would love to say it's true in 2021, but I think we all know that, that isn't the case any longer. Image manipulation can be done by anybody with image editing software. And a lot of cameras actually come with image filters that change, uh, for example, this one here on the bottom right. Um, that change a person's look just for the fun of it. And it's, so it's born manipulated and not um, made manipulated after having been uh, created. Don't get me wrong. We have to manipulate some images. And of course, manipulating images is fun as well. But if you look at things like images that come from the Hubble telescope or from a, an electron microscope, there are steps that have to be taken in order to make these images intelligible to human beings. So manipulation of images is not inherently a bad thing. It's simply something that we need to understand better when we look at our images. Authentic photographs have an important, extremely important role to play in society. In fact, they, um, if we can identify our photographs that are authentic, it's one of the touchstones of reality that we have available to us in this kind of crazy digital world that, we, that, that we're living in. In terms of open source, um, I wanna thank um, Ginny and Sandra uh, for this opportunity to speak to you because it's really broadened my understanding of open source. And I perhaps at this point should say that if I get anything wrong in what I say about open source, it's me as a learner and still understanding open source better. Um, and I would be more than happy if you wanna send me an email later and say, you know, this is, it, you should really think of it this way. I'd be grateful for those kinds of, uh, of comments. But my understanding is that these are all the different, these are some of the many kinds of uh, artifacts that can be considered an open source item. And I was looking at it and I was thinking, okay, which one of these are impacted by my work, which is the image credibility perspective. And I ultimately had to determine that they were all potentially uh, impacted by image credibility because some of them may include content uh, that are images, some of them, these items, even when they're not an image, might have been recorded and now they are an image. And then of course, there's lots and lots of derivative material that might come from these that would include images. So basically I think that um, most, if not all open source items have uh, 
a relationship with image credibility. In looking at the terms of reference for uh, open access Australasia, I saw that these particular ones seemed to me most relevant to uh, the bridge between Creative Commons and my research in image credibility and the, the work of the OAA group. Um, and in particular, the second bullet point in the uh, top, to identify potential issues for the future, including their complexities and possible impacts, I think is particularly relevant for this talk. But the others that are here, I think also are relevant. So that was the introduction and context. Um, the next thing I wanna go to is talk about human perspectives on image credibility. There are many perspectives that people have on any given image. This is one of my favorite images, and I'm referring to the one in the center. Uh, this image was taken on the 18th of July, 1860 at 2.36 p.m. in the afternoon. And the reason that we know this so, so precisely is because this is a photograph of the, an eclipse totality um, that took place on that day at that time in Riverbellosa, Spain. And it was taken by Warren de la Rue, uh, who lives in London. And the thing that I find interesting about this is it's very poetic in that there's a lot of meaning and, uh, and perspectives that are compressed into something that is extremely simple and elegant. Travel. Warren de la Rue had to travel 1400 kilometers to get to River Bellosa to be there at the time of the totality. And he had to cart tons of photographic equipment, literally tons of photographic uh, equipment with him. So somebody who's interested in this photograph from the perspective of travel is going to be more interested in, you know, how did he get there and what did he take and how did he manage all of this? Astronomy. If you're interested in astronomy, you'd be like, how is it that he knew that the eclipse was going to happen at that moment in time? If you're interested in history, we would be interested in the fact that this is the first image of something called Bailey's beads uh, back then and what's known now as solar flares. Um, if you're interested in printing, you'd be interested in the fact that this is in Quentin Bajak's book on printing. And if you're interested in chemistry, well, the photography one that's there is relates to all of the equipment that they would be carting around. But if you're interested in chemistry, and this is my favorite one, is, is that the reason that this is such a beautiful golden color, which is just, just exquisite, is because when he was doing all of this work on this photograph, he was working in a tent that he had set up uh, after all of this travel with all of the stuff that he had brought. And in the process of doing this, he didn't really clear off as much of the hyposulfite solution that he used to fix this, the, the image on the page um, as he might have been able to do in a different sort of more permanent lab. And as a result, the sulfites in the uh, chemistry caused that image to become more golden uh, rather than a black and white image. So these are all the, you know, you're looking at one image and it can be viewed from so many different perspectives. And that, that kind of implies that the creator's intent in creating an image is not the final say. When we look at the images that we are, uh, are viewing, we have, we apply our affective reasoning, our emotive reasoning, and we use our brains, we use our intellectual reasoning when we look at it. Um, all of that is really important, but the really important question to ask ourselves is, is that are we building our intellectual and emotive reasoning on solid ground, that is to say, an image that we can rely on, that we can believe in, that's credible, or are we building it on shifting sand because we really don't know? Now, when I have these conversations with people, I basically it basically boils down to three arguments whenever people talk about image credibility not being important. I hear that photos have always been manipulated. And here's an image of one of the earliest manipulated photographs. This was done in um, five negatives, 1869. Um, and uh, any photograph is subjective from the moment the photo photographer frames it up in his or her viewfinder. Uh, and that is true as well. Um, and then the last one, which is my favorite is, come on, Sabrina, what is reality anyway? And that can, basically drag you down into an extremely existential discussion about magnetic forces and you know, the space between atoms. It gets really crazy sometimes. At the end of the day, I think image credibility is basically 
when you're talking about a rep representative photograph is, is this what was there in front of the camera at the time that the photograph was taken? How do people feel about it? Well, in one of the experiments that I've done, um, people think that it's difficult to tell if a photograph is manipulated and possibly after the little exercise we did a few minutes ago, you will think maybe that's the case also. Um, how much do you care? I asked a number of, of people. This is uh, 107. Most of they were uh, university students. I, I, they're not first year, but all, all throughout the four years. Um, they care somewhat. How much do you think it matters? People think it's significant. And how concerned are you that there's no authentication process for digital photographs? And people are very concerned. I, I want to mention in passing that there's a number of forensic techniques that people can use that are effective in certain circumstances. But in general, the average person does not see a photograph with its forensic uh, analysis as well. And as we all know, photographs are used to manipulate the way that we think about things. And uh, I normally would go through this. I think on this occasion, I'll leave you to read this later on with the exception of one photograph. And that is the one at the bottom middle. This is probably one of the more important photographs of my life because it changed my way of thinking about manipulated images when I saw it uh, way back in 2006. <coughs> Excuse me. And when I looked at this image and I realized that somebody, Adnan Hajj, um, had actually, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, had actually cloned these smoke columns across the landscape. I thought about it and I realized that people, if they were to judge a situation based solely on this image, could take some pretty dramatic decisions um, and, and so suddenly I realized that manipulated photographs could be a case of life and death. And I have learned since then that indeed, not with this specific photograph, but with other photographs, that there have been cases where people have been killed on the basis of a manipulated photograph. So human perceptions, are we able to actually spot uh, photo uh, manipulations? So here's a, an image. I'm not going to ask you to tell me in Socrative whether or not you think that it was manipulated, but just for a minute, have a look at it and, and think about whether or not you think it might be manipulated. So this is a really good example of a way that you can, without any special techniques, decide whether or not an image has been manipulated. And that is something that we humans intuitively are bad at, something that in our, our brains we discard when we look at a landscape uh, because they're, it's usually not very important, but we can in fact choose to look at these things and they are shadows. If you have a look at the lineup of the shadows on the ground with the objects in the air, it's easy to see that this photograph was taken at at least three different times uh, in that day. So that's one of the things that you can look at. It really, if you're, if you really got your eye in, all you have to do is look at a situation like that. Note that this, the shadow on this side is within the line of the object that it's reflecting. And it also is the same on this side. So an educated eye can look at a photograph like this and tell in less than a second that it's been manipulated. And if you look at the shadows, you will find that you can uh, see a lot more of that too. Now I did some uh, research uh, in eye gaze tracking, which is basically where you use infrared cameras to bounce off the eyes of a person looking at an image on a screen. And then the computer will record where the eyes are looking on that screen. In my case, within the uh, frame of an image. Our eyes may basically move in jerky motions. We look at something, we fixate on it for a moment, and then we jump to something else. And during that jump, we don't, it's really not clear exactly what we see, but we don't seem to see very much. We basically go from one place to another and we build up a picture of something in that way. This helps us to, so this kind of technology helps us to understand what people are actually looking at in an image. Uh, this is, I'm gonna give you the answer right away. And that is, is that no, we can't really tell. 
So if you have a look at this graph, these are 14 images that I showed about 80 uh, people. And I said, is this manipulated or is this not manipulated? And the outside ring is 100%. As you can see that nobody got it 100% right and nobody was 100% confident. If you look at the yellow area, the yellow area is indicating how confident were people that they had gotten it right when they answered the question. And as you can see, the yellow area is significantly in most cases, except for the one ludicrous cow on the car case, um, in most cases, people were more confident they, than they, that they were right than they were in fact right. So the green area is the accuracy. So they were accurate to this extent, then they were confident to a greater extent, but even so nobody, there was always a 20% margin for I just don't know, which I think is really interesting. In this particular case, only 11 participants out of 70 gave a valid response for which missile was, had been cloned into the image, even when they'd been told that one of them had been cloned in, they were unable to identify which one it was. So this is just really um, highlighting how poorly we uh, identify whether an image has been manipulated. Largely what happens is people look first for what is the meaning of this photograph before they contemplate whether or not it's real. This is a heat map of people looking at things. The main point that I want to make here is, is that the longer that we look at an image, in this case, this is John Howard at the opening of the National Museum of Australia, which I attended. And there was a light board at the back, which is only meant to be reflecting light. I uh, in, in inserted a picture of the queen because John Howard is well known to have been and presumably still is a monarchist. And, uh, and so, then I wanted to find out, did people see that? And did they see that that was a manipulation of the image? And it, over here on the right, people who got it right more had paid more attention to the places where the manipulations took place. So um, while it's difficult to say that whether they looked at it more because they saw it or they looked at it more because they didn't know or they just happened to look at it more, I don't have an answer for that. But I do have an answer for the fact that it's more likely the person is going to get it right if they look at something for longer. The other thing that people use when they uh, look at an image is logic. And I also wanted to call it a, a particularly uncertainty. When people, this is the image that I promised to talk about a little bit more later. This is a Bruxia micra chameleon. And it is in fact a real photograph of a chameleon the size of a match head. And it was so interesting, the logic that people use to say that you know, the first one is there aren't any lizards that small. That, that seems like a actually kind of a common sense kind of a thing to say. Uh, but the other ones were really interesting, and that's that the lizard couldn't have been on the match when it burnt or it would have been killed. I'm thinking, well, at the very least, it could possibly have been cold at the time. But mostly it was a cultural thing because matches aren't red tipped all around the world. Some of them are black tipped. And in this case, we've got a black tipped match. And so people didn't think it was true because of the color of the match. Um, the other, the one in the middle, you can have a look at later. The one on the right hand side is actually a bit of a meme on online. It's possible some of you have seen this one before. And the logic that people, but at the time that I was doing this experiment, it wasn't quite as popular and a lot of people hadn't seen it before. And the logic that was used there was very interesting. The person who had previous experience knew that this cow weighs that much there's no way that it got up on this car to get to escape from the cold snow onto the warm bonnet of a car, which presumably has just been driven. And also the one woman who really cracked me up said in such a beautiful Russian accent, which I could never replicate that in Russia, we can train them to do that. And then the last thing I wanted to say on this slide is the uncertainty. So the, the lack of confidence that was often expressed and people saying, well, I think this is the case, or I believe this is, I'm not sure, etc. People just aren't 100% sure. And of course, that doesn't include people who were unsure and never said a word about their uncertainty. I would encourage you to go and find this image online, Fighting Fakes, Deep Fakes. This is uh, where a director by the name of Jordan Peele demonstrated with the artificial intelligence, you can make a known figure appear to be saying th things that they're not saying, which I find particularly frightening, 
but really important to understand because we really have to be aware of that. I foresee in the future at some point one of these being distributed and believed by the public because um, it's just inevitable. People will do that kind of thing. And uh, the other thing here is, is that we actually can create this woman here. She doesn't exist. She never existed. Uh, this is an artificial intelligence, uh, two networks talking to one another where one has been trained on what a face looks like and the other one is trying to make a face. So the one that's make, trying to make a face presents something to the second one. The second one says, I know what faces look like and that's not one. So the first one goes back and tries again. And then that just goes round and round and round and round. And as you can see in this case, 10 million revisions over 18 days. Ultimately, we have a picture of something that the second network said, yes, that's a face. So this is a completely artificial generated face. Some years ago, I had the opportunity to speak to the then director of the National Library of Australia, Anne-Marie Schwartlich. And she made the comment that we're currently living in what she referred to as the digital dark ages. That phrase really resonated with me and has stuck with me. And I believe that we're still in the digital dark ages because we still don't have enough information to tell if the photos we are seeing are representative or synthetic or something in between. And we are going to be remaining in these digital dark ages until we can come up with some solutions for the problems that we have been exploring today. There are some solutions on the drawing board which is great. They're all in very early stages. Let's explore what those things might be. The first thing though is, is metadata the answer? And the answer is definitely, at least to a certain degree. There are still a lot of problems with metadata. For example, there are a lot of people who don't actually know how to find metadata in an image. And so that for them, metadata is invisible. We need metadata to be visible to everybody. We need more metadata, not just more, but better metadata. Things like titles of the work, things like editing comments. We need new file formats and other technologies to support this. We need to have accountability so that there's a reputational cost when people put out images that are meant to be misinformative or disinformative. And to do all of these things, we need new ways of doing things. Social media sites often are playing against the, this, this outcome. Here's a photograph I took of the Auckland Sky Tower in 2004. And when I took the photograph, I had it, uh, it was just a little bit askew, just at about a degree out of kilter because I wanted the Sky Tower to be completely vertical. Um, and perpendicular to the horizon. So I altered it, I rotated it a, a one degree. And in the metadata, which you see there, I put uh, the, that information into the comments. I also gave it a title and I included the date that I took this image. Then I uploaded this photograph to Facebook to see what would happen. As you can see, there are quite a lot of redactions in the, I guess it's not redactions, it looks like redactions, it's actually eliminations. The, the, uh, the red bars are things that I put there to illustrate for you what has been taken away. Um, but if you were to look at this image, uh, download it from Facebook after I had uploaded it, you would find that all of these places where there's red bars, there's no longer any metadata available in those places. So all of the camera details that had been uploaded the title that I wrote, the command, the, importantly, the comments that I wrote where I described the editing that I had done to this photograph have all been taken away, uh, stripped from the metadata and can no longer be seen. So we have to assume that not only is metadata difficult to work with, but it's quite fragile in certain circumstances, such as being used in a social media setting. So this is a big problem, isn't it? Who is trying to solve it? There are some very interesting initiatives and I'm going to touch on a few of them. The first one of them is Creative Commons, of course. There are some really important things that Creative Commons offers in terms of scaffolding reliability of images. For example, um, having license, a license structure that offers creators of their 
of photographs and other images, the opportunity to clarify uh, the ways in which that person can actually use it. An important part of that is the attribution. So the BY in a Creative Commons license where the person who's created it, their name is inextricably linked with that piece of media or that media asset, that piece of work. Um, another thing is the license legs that the Creative Commons license rests on is about human understandable descriptions and specifically around metadata and you know, how can we use this? So there's a lot of really good work in Creative Commons that relates directly to being able to understand more about the image that we're looking at. And those are some of the licenses which I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with. This uh, particular initiative here, the JPEG Stake and Fake Media Initiative, I'm very involved with it. I'm very excited about it. Basically what happened is, is that in 2019, JPEG put out a call. They wanted to know where they should focus their attention for going on with, because as probably you'd all be aware, JPEG is the most familiar file format for an image in the world. And taking that, that, that platform and that power and putting it to good use is something that they wish to do. So about 30 people responded and presented to them on ideas and five, uh, uh, six, myself and five others responded in respect of, we believe that you should be looking at fake media, at image credibility, so that's what um, happily in 2020, uh, JPEG put out a media release on this topic saying that that would be the, the focus. So there is this initiative called JPEG Stake and Fake Media where, we're, where there was an ad hoc working group formed to look at what are the elements that go into image credibility and how does that relate to the technology of the file format. And then uh, earlier this year, I was appointed as a member of the JPEG Committee through Standards Australia. This process uh, is currently in the stage where we're finalizing the functional requirements for the standard, and then that standard is going to be released for public comment and uh, for development. So watch this space. It will be very interesting over the next couple of years. And the last of these group of people that I want to talk about is the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, C2PA is what it's called. And this was a group of two, two groups of people who came together, the Content Authenticity Initiative and Project Origin, both of which were focused on understanding how to authenticate uh, digital imagery, digital content generally, but especially digital imagery uh, is the focus that I have in respect of what they're doing there. And they are working on a physical uh, digital framework within which images can be shown, which start to tackle some of the kinds of problems that are being discussed uh, today. So that'll be a very interesting thing to see um, in the coming year or two as well. Overall, pulling all of this together, I believe that the solution for image credibility is a social and a technological, technological uh, problem. You can't do just a technological response and you can't just have a social response. You need to have a marriage of the two. And I believe that if we take people who are able and willing to assert the editing and the credibility uh, credentials of the media asset that, that they create, we add it to the technology that allows them to do that in an easy and visible way. We apply processes and standards that are we're all familiar with and know how to use as, as societies around the world. And then we adopt it in our communities and our organizations. Then I think what we've got is a workable solution, which is great because it's a really difficult problem. Now, I promised that I was going to offer some points to ponder, some open points to ponder. And you probably imagined I was talking about ideas or concepts, but I'm actually talking about specific points. Uh, let, so let me explain. I recently completed this model where I'm looking at uh, the life cycle of an image from creation through distribution, consumption, and disposition. 
Uh, I'm doing this as part of an overall attempt to look at Susan Sontag's notion of an ecology of images and how one of those can be created. And in the first instance, for me, that meant identifying what a life cycle of an image might look like. If you have a look at the bottom orangish uh, square where it says start here, that's the, the entry point to this life cycle. It uh, may, it, the, and this entry point works for both a photograph out of a camera and an image that's being created, including vector graphics and anime and all kinds of different other kinds of images. Basically any image can start at this place and then go through this cycle. So how does that relate to, um, to open? So in the first instance, as I just said, an image would be created. It would be synthetic, or it would be a photograph or video or some other sensor. A provenance is collected around either one of these types of images or combination thereof. Processing takes place and we end up with a package which is an image and its provenance. Open source uses some of these kinds of elements, methods and processes, templates, software, licensing metadata, attribution metadata, algorithms. I'm sure there's lots more, but these are maybe something to get started with. And I attempted to map these kinds of open source elements to uh, the model of this image life cycle, describing where certain kinds of elements might be more, uh, require, have a higher profile than other kinds of elements. I am certainly not going to attempt to cover each one of these elements because we don't have that kind of time. But I think that if you have a look at this, especially in, from, the, from the perspective of the, of the thing that you're interested in, maybe you'll get um, some interesting insights into the overall process of uh, an image life cycle and where the thing that you're particularly interested in might come in more than in other locations. And I've done that for each one of these segments. So for distribution, you can see that um, there most of these things actually apply in, in this area. When the image is consumed, this is really where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. This is where a person looks at an image, ingests it into their worldview or, or applies it into their knowledge framework for the thing that they're currently focusing on or simply looks at it and enjoys it and moves on. These are the areas where the image is, is being consumed. And there are many ways in which some of the things that are open would apply to this stage. And ultimately there is a disposition. Now the disposi disposition in some cases will be destruction. We all know that there are certain sites on uh, social media sites where images aren't going to last very long at all. Um, they may go into storage or archive. That's going to be where a lot of the really enduring images are going to be stored by GLAM organizations, for example. And then there are some that will go back into a remix situation and, um, and start again here at uh, the start here point and do the whole loop again in some form. There's this little um, image that I have here is not a little image at all. It's made out of 5,000 different images by a, an artist named Beeple, digital artist named Beeple, who is Mike Windelman. And pro possibly many of you will have heard of this earlier this year. It was sold uh, via a non-fungible token. And uh, it's too difficult to talk about NFTs in this meeting, but um, the question, there's a lot of question about what exactly an NFT is because the artwork itself was not sold. It was the NFT that was sold. Um, and it was sold for $69 million. So this is a, a whole new way that's just coming on the market of compartmentalizing a digital media asset into a particular entity that can then be used. So it gets very interesting from there. And these are some of the other ways in which uh, open elements apply to this part of the life cycle. Securing image credibility is a very thorny socio-scientific issue, and it needs a, a wide range of skills. It needs 
people who are able to deal with complexity, people who are able to deal with inquiry, to um, ask questions about an issue and to, to research answers to those questions and formulate new questions. Perspective taking. Not everybody looks at image credibility from the same perspective. For me, it was a bit of a journey to learn that non, uh, that images that have been manipulated are just as valid in many circumstances as images that have not been manipulated. And so that was a learning process for me. And there will be lots of uh, people who still, for whom learning that an image is important when it has not been manipulated will be a learning journey. Being skeptical. This is certainly true when you're looking at any image. Keep in mind that you are less able to recognize manipulated images than you think you are based on the research that we talked about today. And also understanding the affordances and limitations of science. That is to say what I said a little bit earlier and that's that society is part of the answer, not just technology. So in conclusion, the role for open is uh, applicable in most, if not every single one of the aspects of this process. Humans will need technology and we will need more technology and better technology in this area. And we always need context in order to understand an image and for that image to be enduring into the future. Technology carefully applied can provide these solutions. Uh, in particular, warding off the digital cliff where an image is perfect until it suddenly ceases to exist for some reason in comparison to a, a analog, analog photograph, which might just degrade over time until ultimately it's not usable. Digital images can suddenly cease to uh, exist. Um, we need technology that supports trust and authenticity. We uh, need technology that will help the provenance, the metadata, the information about the images to remain with the images or at least be able to be retrieved again if anything happens to it. And we have approaches that are being developed right now, solutions that are on the drawing board, things that people are working on. And it's really fluid right now. There's never gonna be a better time to jump in and get involved in the process of building an image credibility beachhead within a, a digital environment, which is increasingly difficult to navigate in terms of accuracy and fact. And that's all from me. I have references in the uh, slides later on for you to have a look at. Please do not hesitate to contact me with any questions that you might have. Thank you. Bye.